Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I like to discuss how Boris Johnson, who has been Prime Minister, remember, for only three, albeit chaotic, years, has lost two ethics advisers in this time now. You know, not to personal reasons or career changes. He's lost them because he refused to comply with the standards on ethics that he set for himself and other ministers. But what is making this one particularly spicy news is that the government were trying to suppress the reasons by trying to stop Lord Guite's letter of resignation from being published, and it didn't succeed, and now we've seen it, and now we see why. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So, uh, to lose one ethics advisor may be misfortune, to lose two smacks of unethical behaviour on a scale normally only found in comic book villains. Lord Guy finally announced his resignation this week, in my view, long after he clearly had no honourable choice. He was regarded as a very decent man when he first took the job, by some anyway, by many actually, across the political spectrum. You know, and some are defending him still, excusing his continuation in the post on the basis that he thought he could bring small, useful changes over time by wading into the swamp. And I don't dismiss the notion, because you see it everywhere, I've seen it in lots of places. But I would just point out a few things. The first major test Guy was given was to investigate Boris Johnson's flat refurbishment. He went, Boris Johnson that is, he went well over budget, and he, so he got, because he didn't want to pay for it himself, he got a Tory donor to fund it. But Johnson kept this arrangement secret. When the news broke, Guy investigated, but he didn't actually look for evidence. He just asked Boris Johnson, a known liar, some questions, and based his decision uh, that, that Johnson didn't breach the ministerial code by lying to Parliament on what Johnson told him. Like, can you imagine if the police investigated a burglary? Oh, there's something on the camera. They found a person who matched the description. They asked them, did you burgle that house? And they said no. And then the police go, oh, all right, sorry to have bothered you. Conclude that their suspect is innocent and off they go. Well, this is what Guy did. Now, he may not have any training in how to carry out an investigation, so we'll give him this one. But then the Electoral Commission investigated the same thing. But they carried out a pro proper inquiry where they gathered evidence. Johnson had denied knowing that a Tory donor funded this flat refurbishment. You know, as if it was news to him. He said so in Parliament. I didn't even know about this. Which was an odd denial when it's a personal matter for him. The, the refurbishment of this flat, although he was allowed a budget of public money, £30,000, it's still his living space. If he wants to top it up, it's his affair. He's the one who organises the funding for it. It's not a government matter. You know, but, but the Electoral Commission found proof of messages between Johnson and the donor, Lord Brownlow, where Johnson asked him for the money to do up the flat. So Johnson had lied. He tried to claim that he just forgot, oh, I forgot asking for this money. Oh, you forgot asking someone to stump up tens of thousands of pounds to fund your gold wallpaper, did you? Just slipped your mind, did it? So anyway, Guy was forced to reopen the investigation. Now he had proof that, that he failed to bother to find himself, but he still came to the conclusion that Johnson did nothing wrong. You know, bear in mind, Johnson still hadn't even corrected the record in Parliament. You know, at this point, as far as I was concerned, he lost the right to claim to be honourable. He should have done his job, which was to tell Boris Johnson he was in the wrong, and he didn't. Now, if Boris Johnson refused to accept it, then he would have had the option of resigning. But after a string of other scandals, he has now finally resigned. You know, I mean, what choice did he have, quite frankly? In a recent select committee hearing, Geitz had to repeat an earlier statement he'd made whereby he considers it possible that the Prime Minister has himself breached the ministerial code. Uh, this was over the Sue Gray report, specifically. Sort of the police fine, but ultimately it was the Sue Gray report that really uh, was the focus of his attention. And we're told that Guy wrote a very strongly worded letter of resignation, which this morning the government were trying to make sure never saw the light of day. Now here's the thing, you think to yourself, well, we've already seen some fairly aggressive letters of resignation recently from ministers and officials alike. Because remember, Johnson hasn't just lost now two ethics advisers. He lost his ethics champion, a, a ministerial position recently, with again a very damaging letter of resignation. What on earth could be in this letter that means they need to suppress it this badly? 
And it could be, you could think to yourself, well, maybe it was just no worse than some of the others, but it's merely within their power to suppress it because the other letters were just published. This is, it had nothing to do with the government. The authors have published them, you know, because Guy could have published his letter himself uh, and initially at least was choosing not to, presumably for reasons of demonstrating maybe, I don't know, that he's a man of discretion because he still wants future employment, I guess. Well, the letter has been published in the end. Um, it was fairly explosive, but I thought reading it actually made it worse for Geit. You know, because he says in his letter that he would still have been prepared to carry on in the role, but for the questions that arose in the select committee hearing. So I'm reading that as thinking, hang on a minute. So he's claiming he would have carried on despite everything. Despite the fact he's not independent, despite the fact Boris Johnson has no standards at all. He was prepared to carry on as long as he didn't have to be accountable to MPs. That's how I read the letter. You look for yourself. I'll put a link in the description below. I don't think that's a good look for him. In fact, I think this letter is a worse look for Guy than it is for Johnson. But it was still a bad one for Johnson. I mean, there's a line in it which suggests that Johnson was suspending parts of the ministerial code for political ends, referencing the fact that Boris Johnson recently rewrote the ministerial code. So you can see why Johnson wanted the publication of this letter stopped. But it has to be remembered, Guy is not the first of Johnson's ethics advisers to resign. His predecessor, Alex Allen, investigated bullying allegations against the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, do you remember that? And he found that she had breached the ministerial code. You know, the evidence was overwhelming that she was a bully. And the clear consequence at that time was supposed to be resignation. And if the Home Secretary didn't resign, Johnson was expected to sack her. But Johnson didn't sack people for bullying or for any other infractions, quite frankly. So Johnson refused to accept the findings of this ethics advisor. Allen obviously wasn't prepared to hold his nose uh, as long as Guy did, and he resigned. It was unprecedented for a prime minister to dismiss the report of an independent advisor on standards. But of course, Boris Johnson is an unprecedented prime minister. So Guy took a different approach, I think. He seemed to bend over backwards to avoid finding breaches in the ministerial code. Not out of self-interested corruption, I'm quite sure there was none of that. But, you know, I'm happy to accept out of a desire to do some good to improve the system. It's a little bit like it reminds me of, of people, say, uh, supermarket bosses, uh, farmers and things like that, who last year were careful to avoid blaming Brexit directly for the problems they were having because they felt that if they blamed Brexit, They'd no longer have access to ministers and they obviously felt they would be able to do more good to steer the government in a more sensible direction if they worked with them. Obviously, that didn't work. And now we're starting to see more farmers and supermarket executives saying, yeah, do you know what? It's all Brexit. <laughs> and then maybe, you know, Guy sort of was going to come to the same conclusion. But what ultimately forced him to resign was a combination of a couple of things. First of all, like I say, he had to conclude that there was a possibility that Johnson breached the ministerial code. Uh, over the Downing Street parties. At the very least, it indicated a failure of leadership, which is a key part of the code. But the second was in Johnson's refusal to make the role independent. Now, in theory, Guy, like Alan before him, was an independent advisor. But there was no practical muscle behind the word. You know, it was recommended, for example, that Guy should be able to carry out investigations without the instruction of the Prime Minister. But this power was blocked. And without it, Guy would only be able to investigate whatever Johnson asked him to. So even if there were the most overwhelming evidence of a breach of standards by a minister, Guy, as the independent advisor on, on standards, would have no role to play unless Boris Johnson untied his leash. Which meant, of course, that Guy would, in reality, be a puppet advisor. Nothing independent about his role at all. His advice might be independent, but not his role. And another point that, that should be made is that Johnson personally appointed Guy to be, to be his ethics advisor. You know, so with the other one, he sort of inherited it. Yes, I think as far as I can remember. But that also means, so Johnson appointed Guy, which means Lord Guy took the job knowing that Boris Johnson would be his boss and knowing sort of what Boris Johnson was like. I don't know how closely he knew him, but he would have known at least what I knew about him. You know, that... that this time in the role ended up being such a disaster speaks of the fact that Johnson's conduct obviously was very different to what Guy anticipated. Because were it otherwise, Guy wouldn't have accepted the position. He didn't have to. He wasn't exactly scratching around for jobs. You know, he, he uh, 
So he took the role thinking it could do some good. He knew that the previous holder of the post resigned because Johnson refused to apply his own ministerial code. He must surely have known that Boris Johnson had been fired for lying as both a journalist and a government minister. I, 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 I constantly have to just keep checking myself. How do you get fired as a journalist and a politician? Two of the most dishonest jobs in the world. It would have, how bad do you have to be? To, it would have been ridiculous to suppose that Guy considered Johnson to be essentially a decent chap and just in need of some careful guidance in order to set his house in order. I mean, it's just folly. And it doesn't matter whether the folly was in thinking Johnson was willing to work on improving standards or thinking that he could persuade Johnson of the need for improvements. I don't know which it is. It's folly either way. But he's ended his role in the only way it could have ended. Earlier today in Parliament, the Paymaster General was addressing the House and said that the Prime Minister maintains the highest standards in public life. It was greeted by laughter from the MPs present. Oh, and it's not all that funny, is it? Because we've never had a Prime Minister whose debauchery has been on this level. We may well have had Prime Ministers who have as little regard for the rules or who think themselves supremely important. We've definitely had Prime Ministers who are as selfish. But previous very dubious Prime Ministers at least recognise boundaries. They may not have agreed with them. They may have thought that they should be able to ignore the rules, but they understood the rules were there. They understood that there were consequences for crossing those boundaries, even if they wanted to. And so they were careful. Johnson behaves with reckless abandon across these boundaries, and, and that is a reflection on Tory MPs, not Johnson. Yes, Johnson is the one who has vaulted across these boundaries, but he had others who would have done the same, you know, if they thought they could get away with it. You know, that there have been prime ministers where you sort of think if they could have got away with it, they would have done the same. The difference is that previous selfish prime ministers knew that they would not get away with it. Their own MPs would not allow it, and certainly opposition MPs would not. Johnson does this because his MPs do allow it, and he is confident that they will allow it. They've allowed it for three years. Even now, the only reason 148 of them wanted him gone was because they believe they will lose their seat with him in charge. They are acting only out of their own sense of selfish entitlement. There was no talk of a confidence vote when the news emerged of his corrupt funding of his flat, was there? Or even collapsing the Standards Committee, which his MPs happily voted for. They only changed their minds when the public backlash caused them to lose their lead in the polls. Even now, it was still fewer than half of them ranged against Johnson. And most of those only because the vote was secret. This collapse in standards is not just on Boris Johnson. He could not possibly do any of this without the permission of the wider Tory party. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.